Amen. Uh, if you have a Bible, if you turn to Joshua chapter 3, I loved what happened last week. That wasn't that good last Sunday, if you were here. Paul did an amazing job, and um, there was a lot of ministry team available, and a lot of people came forward and got prayer, and um, something's afoot, if you're not aware of it. Something is afoot right now. And uh, we've been talking about this idea of sowing, and I felt like the Lord really spoke to me that it's a theme for the entire year, that we're going to sow. And the verse that we're after is, uh, I think it's Amos 9, 14. It says the plowman will overtake the reaper. And what it means is there's going to be so much sowing and then so much reaping that the person sowing the next crop is going to be running over top of the one reaping because there's going to be so much going on. And that's really, in my mind anyway, that's what we all dream of is, is a move of God that's, it can't be controlled by hum, human beings it's bigger than us, it's, it's, it's God on the move and we're catching up, if you will. Does that make sense? We never wanna have a sort of a religion that's lame, tame, and the same, where, where we're in control of it and we can regulate it and we can administrate it and it, it fits into our schedule because that's not God. How do you know that God doesn't live in a box? And the only time that there was an attempt to keep God in the box, the guy died, his name was Uzzah. There was a box representing the Ark of the Covenant and it was on a cart and the cart started tipping and the box started falling and Uzzah reached out his hand and he died. And it wasn't God being mean, it was communicating the holiness of his presence that God cannot be contained in any of our containers. Isaiah 66 says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where's the house you'll build for me? And yet we know that the New Testament tells us that we're the house. We are the house of God. We're the oikos, we're the oikodome. It's a, it's a spiritual house where God dwells made up of people, and so we are those living stones, and together we make up the dwelling place of God in the Spirit, Ephesians 2 says. It's an awesome reality, isn't it? And uh, so religion is what happens when we make God too small in our eyes. There used to be a song we used to sing in Renewal called, I've Made You Too Small in My Eyes. It was a repentance song, like, Lord, I'm sorry for making you too small. And so sometimes what we do is we we take God and we shape him into a manageable size that we can handle. How do you know that God is wild and free and you just, you can't tame him, you can't control him? He's massive. And he, when he says he wants to do something, he's going to do that thing that he says he's going to do. And I believe that the Lord has said, both for this church in particular, but also for the Central Coast region, that he's going to do something this year that's going to astound us. It says, uh, I think it's in... Habakkuk, it says, uh, if I would have told you ahead of time, you wouldn't have believed me all that the Lord is going to do. And we're in one of those moments right now. And I just, you know, I've, I've just been thinking about how big God is, that he's, he's the God when we're rejoicing, and he's the God when we're grieving. You know, he's the God of the mountains and the God of the valleys. He's the God who speaks with so much majesty that he, his voice breaks the cedars of Lebanon. It just breaks giant trees. But he's got such a tenderness to him that a bruised reed he will not break. And we can hear him in his still small voice like a whisper. His whispers are shouts, amen? He's God when we feel his presence and he's God when we don't feel anything. He's God when we have a preacher preaching and he's God when we have a teacher teaching. Because <laughs> I'm going to teach you. He's the Alpha and the Omega, amen, the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, yet he's full of surprise. How does he pull that off? Completely consistent, yet filled with surprise. He's not the God of either or, he's the God of both and and more. He doesn't fit into our boxes, he creates tension and asks us to live within kingdom tension. And so we're coming into this season where we're very hungry for God encounters, and it's not just an encounter as in an experience. Isolated experiences are okay. What we're, what we're asking God for is that this place, this people would be a dwelling place of God. Now, theologically, this is a dwelling place of God, but experientially, he wants to do way more. He wants us to experience the reality and the weight of his manifest presence to such an extent that we are undone and in our weakness, he's made strong. Two thousand twenty is a year of sowing. 
This message is going to talk about what we can sow to see a move of God. I want to talk to you about sowing into a move of God. When God begins to move, we can, we can be passive, we can agree with it, or we can sow into it so that it goes bigger and faster. Does that make sense? We can agree with what God is doing. I want to begin with a declaration uh, before we read Joshua chapter 3. If you have a Bible, if you just hold it up real quick. This is a brand new declaration for this day. Let's say this together. Our Father, we say yes to a fresh supernatural move of your spirit. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. We ask you to move in each of us individually and together as a family until we are undone by your manifest presence and glory. We ask you to encounter us as we draw near to you through your word and by your spirit in Jesus' name, amen. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you the Reader's Digest version of this message. Then I'm going to take a few minutes to explain that, okay? But here it is in a nutshell. We prepare for a move of God by being happy, holy, and hungry. So let's just say that together. When I'm holy, hungry, and happy, I welcome God encounters. So we're going to read in Joshua chapter 3. I just want to sort of set up the context of Joshua 3. So God's people got delivered by Moses out of Egypt through the ten plagues. They came to uh, a place where they crossed the Red Sea supernaturally. The Egyptians were drowned. And they, were, and they sent in spies to the land of Canaan. This is the land that God promised Abraham and said, this, everywhere you look, it's going to be yours. So they were about to inherit their inheritance. They were going to receive what God had promised. Amen. And they're looking and they're like, let's go send some spies to kind of figure out how to approach this, this conundrum called the promised land. Because there's a bunch of people living there. And uh, we're going to have to do something about those people. So they sent in some 12 spies. And uh, two came back and said, oh my goodness, this is awesome. Giant grapes. It's just the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But 10 of them said, no, no, no. This, it's scary. I mean, they're just... There's these big people, and it's, it's just going to be so hard. And they basically discouraged God's people, Israel, so that, by the way, um, there's very few instances where the majority rules in Scripture. In this case, it was 10 to 2, and the 10 were wrong, and the 2 were right. So don't always listen to the majority. Amen? But there were two, Joshua and Caleb, that said yes. And so Joshua and Caleb, the Lord made him a promise, and he said, hey, uh, this whole generation is going gonna, gonna, I'm gonna to lovingly let them sort of die out in the wilderness. It's not like God killed them. He took care of them. He gave them food. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. But over a 40-year period, that generation of unbelief died. And their kids were raised up, and their kids heard the stories of the miracles, and they heard the stories of why they didn't get in the promised land, and they were ready to go. And so Moses died, and God raises up Joshua and says, I want you to lead them into the promised land, and what's happening is they're about to go in the promised land. They're about to cross the Jordan. And the Jordan is going to open up just like the Red Sea. So the, the Red Sea parted. The waters parted. Some of you have seen the old Ten Commandments movie. And, uh, or you've been to Universal Studios. So you know what it looks like, you know. The waters parted. But same thing happened in, in the Jordan River. And uh, the, Lord's, the Lord came upon Joshua in the same way that he was upon Moses. And the people were, understood that this was their leader. And they, they went forward and they started conquering. During that time, so in that, right before that moment, they're about to go into the promised land. This, these first five verses of Joshua chapter 3 are so instructive. I just want to read them with you, okay? Verse 1, Joshua got up early to lead Israel from Shittim, that's not a cuss word, that's actually the name of the town, to the Jordan River. They camped for a few nights before crossing the Jordan. After three days, the officers of Israel walked through the camp and instructed the people by saying, when you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, pack up your belongings and follow the Ark. Make sure there is a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Don't get too close because you've never gone this way before 
and you'll only know the way as the ark of my presence leads you. How many of you know that that is an eternal principle, that when God's about to do something new, the only assurance you have is his presence? His presence actually lead can... What's true then can be true today. How many of you know that God's presence can lead this congregation? How many of you know that Jesus is the head of the church? It's not my church. Oh, God forbid any pastor that thinks that he or she owns the church. What a ridiculous thought. This is God's church. The Holy Spirit's the administrator of the church. The Father's over the church. And we are stewards of his house. Amen? And he is leading us. And he leads us by his presence. The ark of his presence was what led those people then, and it's what leads us now. Sometimes people say, hey, you don't have this program. Why don't you do this program? I'm like, well, we're waiting for God to lead us. I'm like, that's a dumb reason. I'm like, no, it's not. We want God to lead us. We don't want to just come up with good ideas and then create more work for ourselves. We want the Lord to lead us. Amen? Amen. So um, make sure there's a 1,000 yards between you and the ark. Don't get too close because you've never gone this way before, and you'll only know the way as the ark of my presence leads you. Verse 5, after these instructions, this is what Joshua said. This is what I want to kind of camp out on for a minute. Consecrate yourselves because tomorrow the Lord is going to do wonders among you. That word tomorrow could be literally tomorrow as it was then, or it could be tomorrow. It could be coming up soon. Have you know a day of the Lord is like a thousand years? So tomorrow prophetically can, you know, it can be some period of time. But that word is true. Consecrate ourselves because tomorrow, coming up soon, God's going to do wonders among us. Something wonderful is about to happen, and we can prepare for that. So the first thing I want to say to you, and by the way, we talked about being holy, hungry, and happy, so I'm going to talk about each of those. Number one, being holy means preparation, okay? Being holy means preparation. That word consecrate in the, in the Hebrew, if you look it up, Actually, in, in one place in Jeremiah, it actually is translated preparation. It means per, to prepare. To consecrate yourself is to prepare yourself. God's people were about to enter a new era of life called the promised land. Everything was going to change. They'd been in the era of the desert. Before that, they were in the era of oppression in, Israel, in Egypt, then the desert. Now they're in a new era. They're about to come into a whole new experience in their lives called the promised land. The land flowing with milk and honey. Now, how do you know that when God gives you the promise, sometimes you have to fight for it? So the same thing, the two truths are in the same time. You, you get the promise, but you fight for the thing that God's giving you. It's exactly what happened to the children of Israel. It happens today. So before revival happens, whatever revival means to you, God wants to restore reverence to his people. Holiness is like, it's like reverence before God. It's realizing that he is uniquely holy, and we want to become like him. The word kadash, consecrate, means to prepare. So what are we preparing to do? We're preparing to seek the Lord. There's a fascinating story in the Old Testament. It's about King Asa, A-S-A. He was a king over Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And um, he had a very interesting history, but he was one of the kings that really went after the Lord for almost his entire life. He, he messed up towards the end. He got a, a, a disease in his feet, and he forgot to seek the Lord. He sought physicians. Not that physicians are wrong, but he was supposed to seek the Lord. And, uh, but anyway, he did really well. He was a good king. He, was, he loved God. And I want to just read you at a, at, at a key point in his life. A prophet came to King Asa and had a word for him. I want to just read it to you because I think it's instructive for us. God's spirit came upon Azariah, who found King Asa and said to him publicly, Listen, King Asa, and all of Judah and Benjamin too. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, you will find him. But if you turn away, he will turn away from you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God and without leaders to teach the law. But in their distress, they turned to God and sought him and he was found by them. Now, this prophet goes on. There's a little bit more to the word, but I just want to give you Asa's response. Verse 8, when Asa heard this prophetic word, he found fresh courage to remove idols and to repair the altar of the Lord. He gathered God's people in Jerusalem. Together they sacrificed thousands of cows, sheep, and goats. 
They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord of their forefathers with all their heart and soul. Those who refused to seek the Lord were put to death. Now, that's, we're not, that's not instructive for us. We're not going to kill anyone here. They took an oath and began to eagerly seek God, and soon enough, God was found by them, and they enjoyed peace in every direction. So what did, did you catch the two things that they did? One had to do with idols. One had to do with an altar. One was negative. One was positive. One was getting rid of. One was restoring. They removed the idols from their lives. And they repaired the altar of the Lord. What is the altar of the Lord? It refers to your devotional life. It's the place where you go to have your altar with God or with your family in God. It's that thing that you do. It's that whether it's a physical place in your house or not. My altar used to be when I lived in Akron, Ohio, where we planted church, my altar was a, was a forest. I used to drive down to this Sandusky forest and I would walk these paths for hours. It was my, it was my altar. I invested a lot of hours. When I lived in Shell Beach before Dinosaur Caves Park was there, it was just a field. That was one of my altars when I was teaching in Guadalupe. As a school teacher, I'd come home from school and I'd walk that field for hours into the night sometimes. There wasn't anything going on. Everybody needs, an, needs to have an altar. It's not just a physical location. It's, it's that habit of being with your God. It's, what, it's, it's, it, it's a vehicle that allows you to build intimacy with the Lord. Now, a lot of people are like, no, no, I always have time with God. Well, that's like saying... I always love my spouse, but I never go on dates with her or with him. It's like, of course you always love him, but you need to show it sometimes. You need to do something special. That's what a, that's what a devotional life is. It's, it's going on dates with God. It's not just, yeah, I love God as I'm driving. I, of course you do, but what about special times? What about those times where you just, you put away all distractions and you spend time with him? And to do that, see, we need to remove the idols. Idols is a hard word for us to think of today because we think of statues and we think of, you know, other religions and so on and so forth. But idols, an idol is anything that prevents you or distracts you or even takes away your time or energy from going after God with all your heart. So did you hear that? It's not necessarily this evil statue of a, you know, of, uh, whatever. It's, it's, it's anything that distracts you or takes away your time or energy from going after God with your whole heart. So as Paul said last week, remember a time when you were seeking God with your whole heart and then take a look today. Have, have there been things in your life that have crept in, even good things? Sometimes they're not evil in and of themselves. It could be a particular uh, you know, video game or a, or a TV show, and not that it's evil of itself, but it's taking away your affections and it's, cool, it's pouring water on your fire. And so it's, it, and we declare war on it, not to be religious and say, oh, this show is evil. We declare war on it because we say, you know what, when I watch that show, I forget about God. When I watch that show, I check out of my spiritual life. There's never a time where we're meant to check out. Some people are like, you know, we can drink alcohol as Christians. Maybe so. But the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, which is excess. In other words, there's a point where you start getting influenced by the alcohol and not the Holy Spirit, and that point is wrong. So it's one thing to have a drink or two, that's fine, unless, you're, unless you can't, in which case you shouldn't. And you shouldn't stumble those who can't. But what's more important is, are we under the leadership and control of Holy Spirit at all times? We do not take vacations from God. And so what King Asa, he got a word and it was, hey, I want you to deal with the idols in your life and I want you to rebuild the altar. And that's exactly what they did and, they, and, and here's what's fascinating. I want you guys to understand this. Holiness came before the visitation of God. Like some people are like, well, if God would just touch me, I could be holy. If God would just touch me, I could spend more time with him. These people did it because they wanted God to touch them. Sometimes we, we devalue the power of our own will to such an extent that we become victims, we become helpless. But the reality is, is that you're, you are the only ones on the earth that have an empowered will. You actually can choose. You can choose. Holiness means preparation. Preparation means getting rid of, clearing the way. Remember? Prepare a highway, it said. You know, level the ground. Prepare a way for the Lord to come. Get rid of all the rocks and the things that will stumble you. And build up a highway. 
the first thing we, we do to prepare for a move of God is to be holy. Have you know the Bible says, be holy, for I am holy. Have you know the Bible says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Holiness is not some antiquated religion thing that keeps people oppressed. It's actually, in the scriptures, it's called the beauty of holiness. It says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's a beautiful thing when you finally discover that God is holy. Because that holiness can actually affect your life and my life to such an extent that, that we are, we're not holier than thou, we're just holy. We're pure. We're walking in single-hearted devotion to God. We're not living with multiple gods. We're living with one God. We're not meant to be polytheists, but have one God. Amen? And so if you and I want to prepare an altar for God, we need to get rid of our idols and redig the wells of intimacy. And I want to just tell you that it doesn't take much to refire that engine. I mean, five concerts. I was talking to someone this week, and I understand. He said, it's, I get so distracted in my devotional time. And I'm like, you know what? Whatever you have to do. For me, I, got, I would get so antsy that I decided I needed to walk. And when I would walk, for some reason, because my body was moving, I was able to focus my mind and my heart. Whatever you have to do to not be distracted, do that thing. Whatever that looks like for you. For some people, it's like, I just need to lay down and have total silence. Other people are like, I need to uh, do jumping jacks and I can really focus on Jesus. Great, do jumping jacks and focus on Jesus. But do more than just talk to him in your car. Amen? The second thing is to be hungry. And being hungry means anticipation. If being holy is about preparation, being hungry means anticipate. It's looking forward to. How many of you have uh, had a meal prepared for you that was one of your favorite meals? And as the meal was being prepared, you could smell the aromas. Your mouth started watering. Your stomach started growling. And you almost wanted to get in and get it early, but you also didn't want to spoil it. And yeah? Have you had that experience? Have you been, or maybe you've prepared your own meal, but you're like, you're cooking it. You're like, I can't wait to eat this thing. <laughs> Have you had the opposite experience? Have you had the experience where somebody's preparing something and, and the more they prepare it, the more nauseous you become? <laughs> I had that experience in Mexico. I was visiting David Hogan's ministry and we were high up in the mountains and, and Brother Hogan told everyone, all the visitors, whatever they set before you, you have to eat. No questions asked. You have to finish it. And what would happen is we would go to these remote villages and they would create, uh, were they tamales? They were tamales wrapped in banana leaves or whatever. And they were, they, were th they were big. They were big, <laughs> thick, sort of doughy. I mean, it was corn, but it was doughy-looking, slippery-feeling <laughs> tamales. And uh, when you had one, you were full, and they would give you three or four. And I remember they were excitedly preparing the dish, and I was slowly getting sick. Because after you've been to several villages, you're like, please not tamales, please not tamales, please not ta tamales, awesome. <laughs> and there were at times, even though I'm 6'3 and 205 pounds, there were times where I had to look to other men who were bigger than me to finish my tamales. Because <laughs> somebody had to eat them. You cannot leave, you cannot return your plate with those tamales on there, it's rude. What I love about this story is that King Asa and the people of Judah, they took an oath to seek God. This is what I want to help us understand. They decided to seek God before they felt like seeking God. The hunger began to build after they made a decision. Beloved, we are so feeling dependent that we think to ourselves, I will go to this meeting or this conference or this thing, and we have an experience of a feeling, and we say, now I will make my decision. But your decision is based on that feeling. When the feeling is gone, you have no willpower to continue the commitment, which is why it's better to make a sober decision these people actually, it was administrative. It was a, probably a very boring meeting. They actually took an oath. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I hereby agree to seek the Lord. I hereby agree to seek the Lord. If I do not seek the Lord, you have the right to kill me. You have the right to kill. I mean, that's, that's what they said. They made an oath. They decided they made a decision, and then God came. Does that make sense? We often do the opposite. We're like Doubting Thomas. 
Well, if I touch his hands and I touch his feet and I see the holes, then I'll believe. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, you believe because you've seen how much more blessed are those who believe and then see. And I'm telling you, when it comes to moves of God, we can prepare before those moves happen and align ourselves with what he's about to do. Does this make sense? So being hungry means anticipation. It's, it's looking forward. I love what David said in Psalm 27. By the way, anticipation is grounded in the goodness of God. It's very hard to have anticipation if you don't believe God is good. David said in Psalm 27, I would have despaired. There was so much turmoil in my life. There were so many hard things going on that I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. In other words, I believed that God's goodness was going to show up soon. I didn't know where, how, when, but in the land of the living means not when I die. In my lifetime, God's goodness is going to manifest. And he believed it, and it's what kept him from despairing. Is this making any sense to anyone? You see, some of us have lost our desire for God. We're, we don't have that anticipation because we don't have that hunger, and that hunger is based on desire. I just want to read you a, a verse, a couple of verses. They, it only shows up this way in a couple of translations. So if you look at the translations, there's only two that I'm aware of. You might find three or four, but there's only two that read this way. One of them is the King James, and the other one is the Living Bible. But I love the way they say this, these verses. Okay, I'm going to read these to you. It's uh, Haggai 2, 6, and 7. God Almighty says, Soon I'll, I'll begin shaking the heavens and the earth, including the oceans and every continent. This is, this is a paraphrase of those two verses based on the combination of King James and the Living Bible, okay? God Almighty says, Soon I'll begin shaking the heavens and the earth, including the oceans and every continent. I'll shake all nations, and the desire of all nations, capital D-O-A-N, the desire of all nations will come to this temple, and I'll fill this house with glory. Jesus is the desire of every nation. He's actually what people are longing for without always knowing what they're longing for. He is the desire. He is the one who satisfies the longing in humans' hearts. And being hungry means having a fresh decision to encounter so that we can see him once again and see how desirable he really is. In other words, we make the decision to taste and see, and when we taste and see, we realize how good he is. And when we realize how good he is, we want the whole meal. Tasting and seeing is a decision. Once we taste and see, desire takes over. Does that make sense? But the initial decision is on our end. Don't wait. Don't wait to decide. You know, my mom passed away. It'll be three weeks ago Monday. And uh, it's, it was a very hard thing. I mean, I cried and I felt grief and I felt sadness. And I, I for the first time in my life, this is the first time in my life I, I went through this kind of thing and I let myself feel and didn't make myself feel bad for feeling. Does that make sense? Like I didn't try to clean myself up or be a good pastor or a good Christian. I just, I just felt. I didn't judge my own feelings. I just had feelings and allowed myself to feel those feelings, which was kind of new for me because I tend to plow through, not that I don't feel feelings, but I tend to just sort of exercise my will, which is a good thing, except when you need to grieve. But the, but the Lord was so good, even... When my mom passed away, he spoke to me the same day. And he began, to sp he began to wrap that event into a prophetic lens. And I haven't, been able to, I haven't been able to be as down about the event since he spoke to me those words that came without emotion. Does that make sense? In other words, you don't need emotion to get revelation. You don't need emotion to make a godly decision. You don't need emotion to do the right thing. You can just decide to do the right thing and the emotions will follow. I'm not saying live a life without emotion. I'm saying live a life where you exercise your God-given will and you prepare for the move of God. You and I can sow right into what God's doing right now. We can repair the altar. We can remove the idols. We can anticipate Jesus as we taste and see and we begin to rebuild our hunger. What's another way to rebuild authentic hunger? It's to get rid of junk food, right? which could be related to the idols. It's getting rid of those things that we put into our bellies that actually take away our desire for the real thing. I can't tell you how many times I've 
I've been looking forward to a meal, but I got so hungry that I crammed some sort of snack food or a soda in my belly, and by the time the meal came, I wasn't hungry. I missed out on that good meal because I put junk food in my body, and that took away my desire and my hunger. The same thing is true spiritually. Sometimes we just need to say no to the smaller, lesser things so we can enjoy the big, good thing. And it means stewarding our hunger. Learning to be hungry and be okay with it. It's okay to be hungry because the Bible says I'll fill the hungry with good things. You guys tracking with me right now? I got one more point to make. Being happy means celebration. So I want to just say to you that if, 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 we're going to, if we're going to cooperate with the move of God, if we're going to sow into a move of God, we need to be holy, hungry, and happy. I know you say, well, happy. Why do you have to be happy? Well, you don't have to be happy. You can be miserable if you want. But there's an invitation in God to be happy. And what, what I mean by happy isn't just la-di-da-da-da. I mean, you are experiencing the joy of God. In other words, you're resonating and marinating in the promises of God before they happen. You're choosing to celebrate what is coming as though it already is. One of my favorite verses regarding this reality is it's in 1 Chronicles 16.10 and Psalm 105.3. It says the same thing. It says, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice and be glad. I love that verse because it's saying that you get to have joy in the seeking, not just in the finding. The process is joyful, not just the outcome. In other words, why do you have to be mopey when you're seeking God? Why do you have to, what is this model that we picked up from the Old Testament where we have to be sad, morose, and downcast while we seek God? Why can't we be upbeat, happy, and joyful as we seek the Lord? I'm asking an honest question. There is a paradigm shift that has to happen in the church where we can actually live in the realm of faith that releases joy until we get him, which releases a hundred million times more joy. There's joy in the seeking, but there's joy in the finding. I want to just show you a little chart. It's from Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. I hope you can see that. But in Hebrews 12, there's a contrast between Mount Sinai and Zion. The nature of Sinai is it's a mountain. The nature of Zion, it's a city. It's a heavenly Jerusalem. The rules in Mount Sinai are don't touch. The rule in Zion is, what's it say? Draw near. The consequence in Sinai is if you do it wrong, you're going to get stoned. You get get rocks thrown at you, you, not stoned, you know. (laughs) Not that kind of stoned that's more popular today. But you get, you know, Old Testament stoned. The consequence in Zion is Jesus is my mediator. There's no punishment in Zion. Jesus is my mediator. The experience in Sinai is darkness, whirlwind, gloom, jarring trumpet blast, nothing against a trumpet. Love the trumpet wherever David is. There you are. But it's, it's actually, it's, what they're saying is it's the trumpet blast you don't want to hear. It's when you're trying to sleep and someone blows a trumpet right in your ear. It's overwhelming voice and unbearable commands. In other words, it's too much. Your, your senses are overloaded. You have sensory overload. But it's, in Zion, you have myriads of angels You have a great cloud of witnesses. You have the church of the firstborn, which means that we're family because Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And the righteous ones are made perfect, which means there's no shame, guilt, or or condemnation at all. So the atmosphere is completely joyful. And the reaction in Sinai is fear and trembling. The reaction in in Zion is, is this is a better place. This is a better deal. That's the whole book of Hebrews. It's better. It's a greater, high, better priest, a better temple, a better sacrifice. Everything's better. Now, I want to say to you that we can seek God on the mountain of Sinai, or we can seek God in Zion. If you seek God in the mountain of Sinai, you're living in an Old Testament reality. That's exactly what Hebrews is teaching you. There is a model of seeking God that's sad, miserable, bummed out, Oh, and there is a place for longing and groaning. Don't get me wrong. But we live in Zion. This is our home. And you can seek God and be desperately hungry for him and still be satisfied in him at the same time. You can long for more of God and still be grateful for what you have. You can worship your way into greater encounter by enjoying the Lord that you know 
until he reveals the God that you don't know. Does that make sense? There is more for us, but we don't have to be miserable until we get the more. Is this making any sense at all? We're talking about how do we sow into a move of God? We're at the beginning of a wave. We're, it's, it's, it's beginning to build. And how many of you know good surfers are always looking for the wave? And the good surfers, you always can tell them, they're the, they're the ones that start paddling first. Because they can read the point of the wave better than anybody else. They can see it in the distance and go, that's a wave. And they start paddling. And then the people that are less well-trained paddle after the early adopters. Because they're paddling to do what? They don't create the wave. They position themselves to surf the wave. And God's releasing a wave of the Holy Spirit in this church and in this region. And he's saying, how many of you want to prepare for this move? Let's get rid of our idols. Let's rebuild the altar of our devotional lives. Some of you did things when you were younger that you would now consider foolish, but they're not foolish. They're, they may be childlike, but they're not childish. I used to carry around packs of Bible memorization cards. You remember those things? Any of you who are older? The, the Jan's Bible Bookstore in downtown San Luis Obispo had them. It's now called The Parable. And uh, they had these uh, Bible, they, I think Navigator and those guys produced them, and they, and they just had verses, and you, had, you could buy different packs. And I, I literally had packs upon packs upon packs of verses I would memorize. My church didn't make me do it. It wasn't a program. I just wanted to know the Word of God. I wanted it in me, so when I stand before you today, all these years later, it would come out of me. I also wanted it in me so that when I was alone and the devil was tempting me, it would come out of me. Why? Because the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, and I can chop off the head of the enemy. But if all I have is a little rubber, fake sword, a little dagger, you know, you try to stab the enemy with that, he just laughs at you. you got to have something that's a little beefier than that. But, you know, how many Christians, you get a little bit older, you're like, I, I don't do those things. Why not? Why don't you? Why don't you memorize 100 verses this next year and see what happens to your life? especially about identity and victory and joy and peace and intimacy and promise. I'm going to invite you to respond to the Lord right now, and I just want to sort of clarify what I'm trying to say. The main idea is this. Do you want to sow into this move of God, or do you want to watch other people surf this wave? It's cool to be a spectator unless you're supposed to be a participant. I was just on the pier with my wife the other day. Uh, Andy and Amory did a booth down there. There's a surf contest. I wasn't in the surf contest, so it's fine for me to be a spectator. But if I was in, in the surf contest, it would be weird for me to be standing on the pier unless my heat was done, right? I should be in the water paddling towards the wave. And what I'm saying is there's a wave of the Holy Spirit coming to your life individually, to your family, to your marriage, to your friends, to this church, to the region, and we can literally prepare for it. We can paddle into position, beloved. And it doesn't have to be a morose, sad, bummed out thing. It can actually be a joyful thing where it's like, God, thank you for this word today. I've been drifting a little bit and I forgot. I haven't really realized what I'm trying to do here, but I can cooperate with this move. I want to paddle. I want to be in position. I don't want to be second or third or fourth place. I want to surf the tip of this, tip of this wave. I want to get the best wave possible. I'm not competing against others. I'm competing against a lesser version of myself. And there's an invitation from God to say, Lord, I want to, in my lifetime, I want to see the plowman overtake the reaper. I want, to be, I want there to be so much sowing that there's so much reaping that the sower's overtaking the reaper because it's getting so dang fruitful that I'm so excited to sow again because I know what's going to happen. Can you imagine if we start investing, just if someone gave you a million dollars and said invest this and make it a hundred million, boy, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Well, God's given us faith, and he says count your faith as more precious than gold. Invest your faith into something now and watch what will happen in a year or two as it multiplies and grows and as your faith increases to mega faith. Many of us are talking about seeing miracles and limbs grow out, etc., etc. Why not you? Why not we exercise our faith now 
in the secret place with Jesus and our faith begins to grow and he speaks the word of faith to us and we go out and that happens and we have the story not just for the story's sake but it's because we did we prepared for that move we were in the wave I don't want to live my life as a spectator I want to be in it in the middle of it right where God wants me to be and I don't want to be there alone I want to be there with you guys